You are now listening to Chakras and Shotguns. Welcome to Chakras and Shotguns, the podcast that guides you on a journey of spiritual development and personal preparedness. I'm Jen, a former lawyer, yogi, and human design lover. And I'm Mick, a marketer, shamanic healer, and prepper. The Bible describes hell as a place of eternal punishment for those who have sinned against God. Many people interpret this to mean that hell is a literal physical space located somewhere in the depths of the earth or beyond. But what if that interpretation is wrong? We'll talk today about other interpretations and how worrying about literal hell can impact your energetic body. We'll get to that in a minute, but we'll start as we always do with a little breathwork exercise to put us into a mindful place. So if you can find a comfortable seat or lay down, Letting yourself sink into the earth or your chair. If you're seated, your feet are firmly planted on the ground. If you're laying down, you find yourself completely surrendering and melting into the earth. Taking a deep breath in through your nose. Sighing that breath out through your mouth. Let's take another deep breath in through your nose. Holding at the top. Sighing that breath back out through your mouth. Last one together, inhale in through your nose. Seal your lips and sigh that breath out through your nose. Now that you're aware of the breath, try to match the length of your inhales to your exhales. Finding stillness, finding release, relaxing where you may be holding, relaxing your jaw, your hands, your feet, maybe shrug your shoulders up and down, feel free to take any other movements that you might find relaxing or releasing of anything that you may have been holding before you sat down with us today. For this short time together, I'd like you to envision a yellow ball right below your rib cage. Feel the warmth of this ball warming your body, providing you with energy, providing you with your own inner power. As you envision this ball glowing and glowing inside of you and from within you, take your focus to your third eye, allowing any thoughts, images to come up and just watch them as an observer.
there's a mantra or affirmation or intention that you would like to set, go ahead and set that for today. My mantra or affirmation is I am autonomous, I am powerful, I am divine. Repeat yours or mine, if you would like, to yourself or out loud. Feeling yourself filled with gratitude. And feel free to slowly blink open your eyes and we can get into the rest of the show. Nice. I always love your breath work, Jane. Another good one. (laughs) Thank you. So let's dive into our topic for today. So the concept of hell, it has been a topic of debate and interpretation for many, many years. We wanted to dive into this because from our upbringing and our perspective that we were raised with, the threat of hell has been this constant and consistent source of control that we've experienced. Uh, I remember a while back I was having a conversation with my dad about his spiritual journey. This was probably 15 years ago or so. And he shared with me that, you know, he had at different points in his life experienced some questioning and wanted to explore even some of the things that we talk about on the podcast. Right. But ultimately what brought him back was this idea in the back of his head, like, I don't want to go to hell. Right. There's this like fear there that kind of kept him pigeonholed in the place of kind of where he was raised in terms of spirituality and religion. And the even the idea of exploring some of these other things just felt too much like he might be damning himself, right? And that idea of being trapped intellectually mm. and spiritually, I think is really part of the motivation for this episode, but also I think for the podcast in general, right? Like wanting to to explore and break free from some of those ingrained paradigms. Yeah. I think there was a, um, a fear of not of like the intellectual, but I always felt that our parents, our parents' generation had this fear that if you explored, you were going to fall prey to something foolish Mm. or inauthentic or dark or the occult or all of a sudden you're a devil worshiper, which is also a little bit offensive from the sense of you find me that intellectually weak that I can't explore other points of view Mm -hmm. without coming back to where I said my beliefs were. Yeah. Now, plot twist, we did explore it and now we believe some different things. <laughs> but it's just, it's an interesting conversation. I actually had a conversation with my mother a few, maybe like a month or so ago. And there is a push and pull of, you know, what are you into? And I don't quite understand it. And, and what does this all mean? And her trump card is, well, are you going to heaven when you die? And I'm like, well, and I guess we'll get into that about how we feel about hell. I guess that'll be my answer. So mm-hmm. cliffhanger, small cliffhanger. But I did always wonder about hell from, you know, even like a practical standpoint. And I think that's why I, I question it in church or I've heard some of these questions as well. Like if we bury bodies, how can then we enter into a physical space to be tortured without a physical body? But I mean, I guess probably the answer would be, oh, it's, you know, it's like Beyonce all up in your mind. I don't know that (laughs) it's, you know, you don't need like the earthly body to experience pain and torture. I always struggled with, and this is like my go-to example is in the Christian church, you have to be saved and believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. And if you don't, then you're going to hell. You're not saved. 
And there are groups of people on this planet who don't know what an iPhone is. They don't know who Beyonce is. They don't, you know, they know their tribe and their people. They live in like the Amazon or that one group in that island and that missionary try to show up and they Mm -hmm. killed him. Mm -hmm. They just, they don't know. And some Christians would say, well, that's why it's our duty to be a missionary. And that's, that's cool, I guess. But what about all of the people in that tribe from hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years going backwards, thousands of years going backwards, who have no idea who Jesus Christ is and they're just going to hell. So I really struggled with that let alone, you know, just anybody else who was raised with their own beliefs. And it's like, some people think like, oh, well, if you knew, then if you had heard about Jesus, then you're culpable. But I just, I feel like we were just trying to make it work and make it stick. Mm -hmm. And then you add on top of that, I gave you like the generic version of (laughs) the requirements to be saved. You throw in Church of Christ and it's like, oh, well, you know, y'all was playing the piano and the tambourine and we don't play instruments and like we really do it the right way. Like mm-hmm. my college sweetheart was Church of Christ. And that was a very big argument that we had it was like, I was like, so you saying my grandma went to hell? Mm-hmm. Because if you say my grandma went to hell, then we got beef. Yeah. And I was like, because they had a piano at her church? Like, <laughs> what? Yeah, I um I dated a Seventh day Adventist at one point. Oh. And they believe that the Sabbath is Saturday. And if you don't observe on Saturday, then you are, you know, not in alignment with, you know, what God wants for us. And I'm just like, there's no leeway here. Like, I don't have no leeway. Yeah. None. And it's like, okay, so what if I, what if I observe Sabbath on the Saturday, but I'm an asshole the rest of the week? It's like, but that makes me good. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I... <sighs> I feel you. I feel you. So let's talk about what the Bible actually says about hell and get into like, are we really interpreting correctly? I've spoken before about this on the show, but I've been following along with a metaphysical Bible study for a few months. And my motivation behind it was to try to unpack and decondition a lot of the things that I learned in church that were, you know, basically spoon fed to me by other people. I kind of wanted to have more of a independent self-sufficient relationship with the scripture. And there are kind of a couple of big things that I've taken away from that Bible study that are relevant, I think, to this discussion. First thing, there is so much information below the surface in the Bible. There is meaning in each of the names, the names of the places. There are so many allegories. There is, you know, reference to previous scriptures in later scriptures. And this is something I learned that like back in the day, they actually didn't annotate the Bible. Like, you know, we can say this was the first Corinthian chapter four, verse 12, right? Like, and, and find that they didn't have though that nomenclature. And mm-hmm. so what they would do is they would actually, in the New Testament, for example, they would refer to like the first part of a Old Testament story as almost like this is the reference point for this. Like, basically, I'm trying to refer back refer you back to the story, Hmm. but I don't have any way of telling you. So I'll just kind of like give you the beginning of the story as a part of this new verse to to like basically let you know I'm annotating. I'm like telling you to go back in and get that. Does that make sense? So is it like previously on? Exactly. (laughs) That's literally how they do it. And so I learned that. I'm like, okay, so this is, so a lot of times what you'll see in scripture is they're referring back and they want you to like go back and get the full story to then proceed. So anyway, the point is you can't just take the words at literal face value. Second, context. Context is super important. We know that words have different meaning to different cultures. And so you have to think about the Bible in terms of like Hebrew society thousands of years ago. Yeah, I am. You know, y'all know I'm on TikTok all the time. (laughs) And one thing I really enjoy about TikTok is that there are biblical scholars, people who studied Hebrew, like learned Hebrew to read the original text. And they provided a lot of additional context, of course, use discernment and like look up these people before you like really just Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. dive in, but it's been mind blowing for me because one, that takes a lot of education and knowledge and time Mm -hmm. to do. And that doesn't mean that you've been exposed to those Mm -hmm. people growing up in church. Yep. So, and I'm not even talking about the pastors, you know, the Sunday school teachers, the (laughs) random children's church teacher who's just reading a little list and not the workbook that they bought. Like, and you just don't know if you're getting the full story. Absolutely. I think um, there's that one guy that we really like that's on TikTok. I can't think of his name right now, but he has all the videos where he'll stitch what other people are saying. But yes. So they actually launched a podcast. And, you know, I really I really don't promote other people's podcasts for free on our podcast, but I'm, I'm going to go ahead and shout them out. They have a show called Data Over Dogma. So if you, like, oh. really want to nerd out into, like, biblical text and, like, really hear from people who are biblical scholars check them out one of the co-hosts is actually atheist so it's not like on some we're trying to convert you religiously right. I'm, I'm just trying to tell you what the bible actually says thing. so it's, yeah. it's kind of cool i think they only have like two or three episodes right now but yeah i'll link that podcast in the show notes okay so let's talk about what the bible actually says about hell and the devil <laughs> nowhere is In the Bible, is there a depiction of the devil torturing people surrounded by flames? Like the classic reference. I think we wrote down like cartoon reference, but you see it in a lot of different places. Mm -hmm. And then you also see people get up in arms about depictions of the devil. Like people were very upset with Lil Nas X Mm -hmm. and that video where he was like twerking on the devil. But (laughs) like we just kind of made that up. Like that was just kind of like, the pop culture basically of what we think the devil looks like, but it's not based in biblical text. Exactly. Exactly. It's propaganda. If you're keeping it a book, right? Mm. So some of the terminology that's actually in the Bible around hell, you have things like fire, destruction, brimstone, lake of fire. These are all references that you see in the Bible. There's actually a book I read recently called Hell is Not for Real, Reexamining What the Scriptures Actually Say About Eternal Torment by Micah Stevens, and he's a biblical scholar. And so he talks about all of these words that are used throughout and all these mentions of fire and brimstone. And what he points out, I won't like give you the full breakdown, you know, it's a probably about a hundred page book. <laughs> I won't yeah, I give you exactly I'll give you the, the quick recap. But basically, he says, and he goes in very specific detail and walks you through different scriptures. But the conclusion is that all of those terms are really referring to the destruction of Jerusalem that occurs in the year AD 70. So I will give you a couple of points that kind of support that and back it up. So first, our concept and the word hell is translated from a few different words, but the main one is the Hebrew word Sheol. And that word Sheol, I've actually seen it in certain translations of the Bible. I I don't remember exactly which one, but you might recognize it if you have a a particular translation that keeps that Hebrew word in there. That word Sheol, it appears 66 times in the Old Testament. And if you really analyze the scripture, Sheol is essentially the underworld and all people, both good and bad, go there. And that's according to several different scriptures. If you're curious, I will cite a couple of those scriptures in the show notes, but I won't go into each and every one of them. In the King James Version, it is translated to grave, underworld, as I mentioned already, and in some places they use the word hell. So I, th- I thought that was interesting that it's the same word, but they translate it differently depending on the scripture in the King James Version. But nevertheless, it's never characterized anywhere as a fire-filled place of torture. Then later in the New Testament, There is references that Jesus makes to hell and the word that is translated into hell in those instances is actually Gehenna, G-E-H-E-N-N-A. And this was actually a valley that was southwest of Jerusalem. And again, in the book, the author, he goes through and he like kind of shows in very painstaking detail (laughs) several scriptures that show that. Gehenna is actually a euphemism for the destruction of a city. So then later when there is, you know, mention of fire and brimstone, unquenchable fire, et cetera, et cetera. It's actually Jesus telling the Pharisees that the city of Jerusalem will be burned down, which, as I mentioned, occurs in 70 AD. 
And that's about 37 years after Jesus's death and ascension. So that fire was meant to be more of a sooner rather than later prophecy, not like something that was going to happen 2000 plus years later. Yeah. And in that context, especially when you think about Christians, or maybe I'm thinking about my mother (laughs) talking about the end of days and for my millennials, what were you doing for Y2K (laughs) if you were a young black millennial? (laughs) Not going nowhere. (laughs) Um, We went to the country my mom's from like a rural place in Louisiana and like me, all my cousins, like my mom, all her siblings, like we were like, uh, we're going to go out here. Look, look at me prepping at 13. <laughs> it's like we rolling out and just in case shit goes down, everybody was in church. It was people in church i ain't seen in years and they was just like lord jesus please they was ready to come down and be saved and at 11 59 because they was they didn't we did not know what was going to happen in the year 2000 and it was just like the world's gonna end the world's gonna end and it was just all of this like apocalyptic talk come to find out the whole context was about something that happened man long ago <laughs> I feel like the end of times is a whole other topic, but back to hell. (laughs) Go back to hell. (laughs) That's one interpretation that hell is actually about the destruction of Jerusalem. There are other perspectives as well. For example, in 2001, Pope John Paul II said that hell was the state of those who freely and definitely separate themselves from God, the source of all life and joy. Yeah, I found this article that referenced that and they were... A lot of people apparently in the States were pissed off that he said that. Mm. There was a lot of like, what is he doing? I mean, just for a moment, let's talk about it. If you're using Christianity as a tool for control, you just took the consequences off the table. Mm. If you have been living your life because you did not want to go to hell you just called into question why you've done every single thing in your life mm. and how old were these people? Maybe like in their forties, their fifties. Mm. So yeah, that could cause a little shaking the table and cause a little discomfort. Okay. Okay. I did want to throw in a couple of references to Eastern philosophy and just how they have approached the concept of hell. So the Buddha, he taught that, Hell is a state of mind that is created by our own negative thoughts and actions. Mm. And he emphasized the importance of cultivating positive qualities such as compassion, wisdom, and mindfulness in order to overcome those negative patterns of thought that can lead to the experience of hell like here on earth, right? And his quote was, hell is not a place but a state of mind. The fires of hell are the fires of craving, anger, and ignorance within us. Mm. Then Lao Tzu, I'm hoping I'm saying that right. He's the founder of Taoism, which is from from China. He viewed hell as a transformative process that can lead to spiritual growth and enlightenment. So it was basically this pain and suffering that was a necessary step in the process of spiritual transformation. And basically the ultimate goal is to overcome negative patterns of thought and behavior in order to achieve this state of peace and harmony within. Mm-hmm. I don't know why I said mm-hmm like that, but mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's a different perspective vantage point, mm-hmm. right? It's like, it's not the result of my bad actions mm-hmm. necessarily, but it's the, what I have to face within. It's a mm-hmm. lot. It's a lot of on this journey is a lot of like what you thought you were worried about on the external. You needed to come in, come within mm-hmm. and look at the internal. Yeah, I feel that. So I think as I've kind of grown and been on this spiritual journey, I think my personal thoughts on hell have have evolved some. I remember being back in high school and and we had to read this poem called Dante's Inferno. I still don't understand why we were reading that in school. Like it's got a lot of like Christian themes in it. And I just was like, everybody in my school, not Christian. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Why are we, why are we reading this? But anyway, if you don't know what this poem is, it's a super long poem. I say it's a poem, but it's, it's like 
basically a novel and it's in poetic form. And the the synopsis of it is the author Dante is being led through different layers or circles, concentric circles of hell. And at each circle or each point within descending into to hell deeper and deeper, there's different punishments that are happening to different sinners. So like on the very outskirts of hell are the pagans, the people in the Amazon that Jim was talking about who like have never received the gospel before. And so like they get the lightest punishment, but they're still in hell. But then as you go further and further in, it's like the gluttonists are there and the people who lie are there and they each have like these unique tortures that are happening to them based on the sin they had. And I just remember being like, this is some bullshit. Like, why? this is not true. I remember having that, those thoughts at 17. Hmm. But who was I going to talk to about, about it? So anyway, I think where I'm at today with it is hell is this idea of like being trapped in suffering in this life, right? There's scriptures that talk about how Jesus calls us to bring heaven on earth. And so if we can bring heaven on earth, why couldn't we have the ability to bring hell to earth and that, hmm. through that suffering, through that mindset the Buddha talked about, right? And, you know, we know all around us, people are suffering and experiencing what they would probably consider to be close to hell, if not hell, in this incarnation on earth. So to me, that's what it is. And specifically, I think about what my ancestors went through, right? And in that, we talked about this way back in episode one, but we we went on this trip to Ghana in 2019. And there is this this castle along the coast in Ghana where it's like, the, you know, they, they held all of the enslaved people before transporting them across the Atlantic. And we went down into the dungeon. And in that dungeon, there was a layer of, of human fluids. It was a mix of sweat and blood and excrement and all types of things that was so thick that it had a whole layer of, of flooring, essentially. Like it was just like this thickness across the, the, the floor that it hardened. And so I I would imagine that going through that experience of being stripped of your culture and your humanity and taken away from your family and about to embark on this brutal journey stacked on top of each other where you don't even have space to use the bathroom, like, that sounds like hell. You know what I mean? Yeah. When you think about this from a morality perspective, what's right and what's wrong is determined by punishment, right? So like, if I don't believe in Jesus Christ, or if I don't, well, really like per Christianity, that's really all you got to do. And then try and repent when you sin on the way. But it's this whole idea of if, if I don't follow Jesus Christ, then I will be punished by going to hell. And so like, those are your choices. And then that kind of becomes like your code that you see the world through so you're thinking like oh people who don't know about jesus they're savages or people who do know about it and they choose to go against him they're evil right Mm -hmm. i feel like it's it's also a really great way to justify xenophobia Mm -hmm. and hatred for others right but like still call yourself righteous because Mm -hmm. you're on the right side of the line Mm -hmm. so when you're thinking about this from like just morality and ethics, there was a psychologist, Lawrence Kohlberg, who came up with seven stages of morality that we're supposed to evolve into over the course of our life. And when you're doing things for obedience or to avoid punishment, right? Like, yes, I will go to church and I will be a good Christian and I will get baptized and do the things so I don't go to hell. You're at, you're actually just at the first level mm. of moral development and that's a stage that you're supposed to kind of master and then evolve out of by the time you're like nine or ten years old Mm. so thinking of how we raise children like we might not always explain why something is wrong but we instead teach through reward and punishment so yeah i think it is like if you explain it that way like very black and white like you have to agree that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, or you're going to hell. Mm -hmm. And it's like, there is no why, there's no room for a why there. Mm -hmm. It's just like, this is what you do, and you will be rewarded with heaven. If Mm -hmm. you don't do it, you will be punished and go to hell. Mm -hmm. And so 
it's just with it's similar to how we raise children. We don't explain like why something is wrong. Mm-hmm. Like don't eat dirt. And it's not like, well, why? Well, you know, the dirt has bacteria. Like we don't go into that mm-hmm. level of detail. We eat your vegetables. If you eat your vegetables, we'll take you to the ice cream shop. Or if you don't, you're gonna go to timeout. Like nobody's walking them through B vitamins and you know fiber, gro- <laughs> like fiber growth percentiles. Like nobody's talking about all of that. There's also a level of morality where it's you see this in religion a lot in in different religions. I'm not just picking on Christianity here. Of like. I'll tithe or I will bring an offering to this temple. So you can see this in, you know, certain Asian religions as well. I'll bring an offering and to this to this deity and say like, okay, well, if you take my offering, like I need some from you and it's very transactional. And so these are actually like much lower levels of morality and ethics. Mm. So, you know, it makes you wonder if operating that way and not getting to a deeper level of understanding and faith about your religion, it means you're kind of operating in a childlike state. Mm. And so, but that's like how most people operate. Like most people are like, Hey, I believe what I believe. And this is what I believe. And this is going to keep me from going to hell and you're going to hell. So I'm better than you. Mm. That ego right there. Right. I thought like we need to do a whole episode just on like the concept of ego, but there is this ego inflation that happens when you internalize this idea that you have earned the right to not go to hell or go to heaven and others are going to hell, right? Like we've talked before about like the monks who they seem so pious and so like mindful and enlightened and their ego still becomes inflated by the fact that they've given up their possessions. I'm better than you because I no longer subscribe to the material world right it's like it's the same idea where Mm -hmm. like by in this righteousness you inflate your ego because you're so much better than everybody else yeah you can see it in like in spirituality and people who were christians they're like oh you know you still praying to that white god and like Mm -hmm. you know like you'll you'll see stuff like that i mean i'm talking about the i'm talking about the black ones but like (laughs) no no i hear you but you see it you see it with other things too where it's like you know they'll poo poo or like trivialize like i've heard of yoga studios having classes on sunday saying like this is yoga church almost like this is better and like this is a better way to spend your sunday Mm -hmm. which is like that's still sacred to somebody exactly like you don't have to be shitty about it so yeah but coming back to hell (laughs) i think that you can make it black and white right of Get saved, secure your spot in heaven today, not tomorrow. But I think that most Christians' journey is more nuanced than that, right? I think they make that initial commitment. And then I think what, you know, going back to your point in your story about your dad all the way at the top of the episode about wanting to explore intellectually and just kind of like find out like what people think and oh that's different and that doesn't mean that I have to agree to it but I'm curious and like just honoring your curiosity not doing that to avoid punishment Mm -hmm. being afraid of stepping out of the lines of like I know I said I was saved but like I'm I'm afraid to step too far out of the boundaries because I don't want to make a oopsie poopsie and end up in hell right I think that, I don't know about you, but on this spiritual journey, there were a lot of times where I was like, am I doing the right thing? I feel like this is out of the bounds, out of the boundaries of what I was told was right and okay. And I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to be punished. I don't want to, I don't know, lose my job or something tragic happen or something like that. And so there was a lot of times where I questioned that, but then I, I personally had to take a step back and say, what are my intentions on how I'm moving? Is it curiosity? Is it joy? Is it pleasure? Is it love? Is it light? Am I trying to be a better person? My God could not have been so evolved and so powerful and so all knowing to create the universe and me and all the other beings on this planet and elsewhere. And we see like the beauty and the magnificence of God every day when you just like walk into nature and you just, you look at a waterfall, like what? 
to be so black and white, that there is no wiggle room. Every concept, every idea that has evolved beyond like creating fire in the wheel, God had already conceived of it and already mm. knew how it was going to play out. So how can, how could he, oh, actually I don't gender God, but how could God think so small and be so closed minded? Because if God was that closed minded, we would all kind of look the same. We wouldn't have different skin and hair and interests and all kinds of things. Like we wouldn't have that. Mm -hmm. So I think that's how I ended up getting there and being like, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. And so that was probably when the switch flipped that I can't live my life with the directive that it's about obedience and compliance. Because that's not, that's not a depth of love and faith. That's a depth of fear. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to have that type of relationship with my creator. You know, we talk a lot about fear of God. We hear that a lot in the church. And, and that always didn't, didn't quite sit well with me. That this God was such a benevolent God and was such a beautiful God, but and it was like, love, love God, but fear God. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, you bring up a really good point that is actually in the book that I mentioned earlier. So that book, Hell is Not For Real, the author actually gives this breakdown of scripture. And he he uses the, the term fear of God as an example of how we don't consider the audience and the context of the audience when we interpret the Bible. So... He specifically mentioned like the word biscuit. So for us in the U.S., we know a biscuit as, you know, a round bread like type of dough that is baked and, and we have it for breakfast typically. And in the U.K., a biscuit is a cookie, what we call cookie here. And, you know, it's the same thing when it comes to terms like fearing God or fear of God that show up in the Bible. Like we understand it as being like terrified of God's wrath in like this context, in this time period. And that's definitely how I've heard it preached, as you mentioned, Jen, right? But if you look at that terminology in like the context of all the scriptures where fear of God is mentioned, what we see is that the phrase is actually meant to mean honoring God and walking with God, right? It's about reverence and mm -hmm. not fear. So it's just interesting like how we a lot of times will use our 2023 context and put it on top of the language that's in the Bible. And even that language has been translated from another language, which it may not have meant that in that language. Right. So right. Is, there's a lot of, it's like a big game of telephone sometimes. Yeah. I've And I've heard, and I've heard it preached both ways mm -hmm. about more about a reverence and respect. I think the fear sermons, that I remember were also pulling a lot on this like father child relationship. Mm. And when you think about as a millennial, who was probably preaching that boomers. And then what's the generation before them? The greatest generation. It's annoying. <laughs> boomers and them, they were preaching from, you think about like their parenting style and how parenting styles have evolved since then, their parenting style was really based on fear, not reverence, fear. Yeah. Like, I'm afraid my daddy is going to be my ass if I don't mm -hmm. do what I'm supposed to do. Absolutely. And so I feel like that context, that culturally colored how they also preach that, mm -hmm. which I think is why out of all of this, I will say that your faith is your faith. And it's, again... Instead of looking at the external coming within and you defining what your faith is, because when you look to others and you don't use discernment, or if you were a child and you didn't have dis have as much discernment, religion and faith can be a tool for someone else's agenda mm -hmm. and, or, and really just, and really just their, their truth and like what they believe is right, which might not be right for you. Mm. Now, 
What's the name of this podcast? <laughs> chakras and shotguns. <laughs> so we're going to get into the chakras. Thinking of hell as a literal place and that being used as a tool or a consequence for you not following a faith. And, you know, we were talking about obedience and compliance. This actually can negatively impact your first three chakras. So it brings up emotions of fear, guilt, and shame, which are kind of like the demons in this book that I'm currently reading, which I'll talk about later, but the demons of the first three chakras. So starting with fear, that's in the root chakra. And the root chakra is about safety and stability and security. And fear attacks that. Fear tells you that you're not safe, you're not stable, you're not secure. And so you find yourself proving yourself, um, becoming hyper vigilant of, am I doing the right thing? Am I, am I, am I good enough? Am I going to get to heaven? Have I done enough? And so you're constantly wondering, am I going to be okay? And that's not a great place to be. And so it can show up in your root chakra as feeling contracted and feeling really insecure. And your root is supposed to be very grounding so you can expand and take up space. And so think of the times where spiritually you felt, you just felt really at peace and really safe and what that looks like for you. So then next comes guilt. And that can show up in your sacral chakra and your sacral chakra, the sacral chakra rules emotions and pleasure and passion, joy and movement and sexuality. And when you're thinking about traditional conservative religions, (laughs) each of those things can be a no-go, right? Pleasure of the flesh, (laughs) sexuality, wanton, fornicator, (laughs) Like movement, joy. Well, what is it based in? Are you praise dancing? (laughs) I guess that's okay. And so what ends up happening there is like you feel guilt for feeling. It's like you don't have the right to feel. Especially if it's sexuality and you're feeling sexual urges in a way that is not condoned by a traditional religion. Mm. So what do you do? You suppress. You suppress your emotions. You suppress your sexuality. You suppress the things that give you pleasure. You end up realizing you don't know what pleases you. You don't know how to find joy. And you're you're stuck. Maybe you're not moving as much. Maybe your body feels stagnant. Maybe your body feels heavy. Dancing is like a real nice way to open that up. Dancing, yoga. Some churches believe yoga is... Of the devil. Mm -hmm. And then finally, the emotion of shame that relates to your solar plexus. The solar plexus is actually where you develop your own autonomy and your own will. And it's exactly why I came up with the breath work that I came up with. If you are avoiding expressing your desires in your in your own will and you feel shame about those things. Because you are trying to avoid punishment. You are doing things just for the reward. You are following along because of what everyone else is doing. Because that's what you're supposed to do. You may feel inadequate. You may feel like you can't speak up for your... Well, I mean, that ends up going up to your throat. But you can't speak up for yourself. You can't show up in the way that you want to show up. You end up... All of these things end up contracting, 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 contracting. And making you smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. When I just, I don't believe that God wanted you to show up in this life and reach adulthood to dim your light. This little light of mine. (laughs) You got to let it shine. So you're not, you end up not looking within for your own moral compass. You haven't developed your own moral code and what you stand by and what you want and what you need and what is right and what's wrong for you. And so each of these things can be problematic, but I think when we look at them under the perspective of like the chakra system, it's actually very interesting about how fear, guilt, and shame can 
plague us and keep us from growing and evolving. Mm. In preparing for this episode, I read a really interesting article about religion and morality, and it goes deeper into Klonberg's like seven levels of morals and ethics and how we're all trying to actually get to transcendental morality, which is actually a lot closer to Jesus's teachings Mm -hmm. about agape love and just the inner love that I have for myself and for others and for other human beings that if we all, uh, you know, subscribe to that, what the world could look like. And Mm. that's where we're all trying to get to. And that's where we should be focused. And I guess I'll I'll say this because I kind of feel like I've been like, on Christianity, but I just really want us to get to whatever spiritual system that you subscribe to. I want it to be one of love and light and joy and how, and what that looks like for you to be of love and light and joy and not about condemnation and that you're sinful and unworthy and, or everyone else is sinful and unworthy. And just like these really like dense negative Mm -hmm. ways that we have to talk about ourselves and others in traditional conservative religions. All right, guys. Hopefully that sparks some internal dialogue, some questioning. If you have some questions, we haven't done this in a while, but if you have some questions, we haven't gotten questions from from our listeners and emails. If you want to have a dialogue with us about this topic, I'm, I'm sure there's some thoughts that'll be sparked, hit us up on our email address, shockersandshotguns at gmail.com or shoot us a DM on Instagram. Before we go though, we do want to remind you guys to sign up for our live full moon workshop that we'll be doing on May 5th. We mentioned it first in the last episode. So definitely sign up in the link that is in the show description. And finally, if you're loving the show, please subscribe and give us five stars wherever you listen. Namaste.